On January 2nd, 2007, eight men got on a plane bound for Africa. Really from concept to the end, it was a journey with the Lord. I really felt that. We were there to assist the Jamesons, who's a missionary family, working in Kenya. Father God, we just praise you. We just thank you so much for safe travel here and just getting everyone here on your time. And uh, we just thank you for this beautiful day, God. I just pray that as we embark on this trip today, God, that you would just have your hand on what we're doing and that we would be open to your direction and to your leading and, and not to our own agenda and that you would just work on us through this trip. I know you're going to use us in whatever way possible, but I pray that our hearts would be open for you to mold them and uh, change them and uh, speak to us in whichever way you please. That's how we pray. Amen. The first full day in Kenya was a travel day. We got in the vans and then we drove six hours, I think, um, up to the game park. And that was uh, quite a bumpy ride. They had just had a lot of rain a few days earlier, so all the roads were completely washed out. Uh, but these little Toyota vans, I'll tell you what, they, they'll give any Hummer in Dallas a run for their money, that's for sure. And we had some really great drivers too, but man, you go on a, a six hour ride like that, I don't, if you have any degree of motion sickness, uh, you are not a happy camper. Blake was feeling pretty sick uh, about that time. <laughs> yeah, Blake got a new nickname that day, we started calling him uh, Pastor Chuck. Pastor <laughs> Chuck took it down out there. Oof. Poor guy. <laughs> Blake, that's funny. <laughs> that's right. You feeling better though, man? Seriously? I am feeling better now. Good. Yeah, everybody picked on him a little bit, but uh, overall, I mean, we had a just an awesome team of guys. Um, we had a lot of fun together. What are you doing, African unit? Get back to your roots I am. I'm bonding with my motherland. And everybody just got along so well, but I'll tell you what, uh, <laughs> if this uh, trip proved anything, it's that uh, God can use anybody. He's just looking for somebody who's willing to go. There we go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so Brian, tell us what we're about to go do. Well, we're heading down to a small Maasai village where we're going to do some, uh, some teaching, some storytelling uh, from the Bible to a local Maasai community. And then uh, at night, we're going to show the Jesus. That was the plan, but it didn't work out that day for us to do that. We couldn't go any further because it was muddy because of all the flooding that's been going on there. But the amazing thing about that was that these two Maasai individuals, um, they ran eight to 10 miles just to tell us, hey, don't go any further, you're gonna get stuck in the mud. And Todd took the opportunity to witness to these two boys and in the process he found out that they were already Christians, but they had never seen the gospel presented in a visual way. So he walked them through the Evangel Cube and, uh, and then he gave it to them as a tool for them to use to witness to others. And, uh, I think he made his first Maasai friend that day. My main highlight of our time with the Maasai was going to the church service that they uh, held for us. Uh, because they heard that visitors were coming to spend time doing ministry, they walked from, you know, some of them from several miles from surrounding Bomas to come to the small church that was centrally located um, so that they could uh, participate in um, um, what we were doing there in ministry. About a thousand people within reach of this church. That's incredible. But the other side, when we go inside and you see how many people came, you can get a good representation of how much the gospel has penetrated. Um, we were we were visitors there, and we got uh, each had the opportunity to share a story um, with the people who were attending. The story that I have for you is a story of a very good man God never stops loving us either. And I will wait for you, almighty God. In the beauty of your holiness, and I will worship you. After that, we left the Maasai church and uh, waited for the sun to go down so that we could go back out into the bush and show the Jesus film. 
we all got the experience of seeing an amazing sight of a jet black night, no light whatsoever except this tiny little battery powered video projector being powered by an iPod. It was amazing to see these people who are cattle farmers. You know, there's no electricity, no running water, mud huts, and we have this portable projector and we're showing people the Jesus film way out with sound in their language. It was amazing. The next day we flew from the Amboseli Game Park and the Maasai people into uh, Nairobi and experienced a kind of a westernized modern mega church, the, the, the Baptist Church of Nairobi. And we flew again to uh, Katali um, and uh, made our way eventually to where we would live for the next five nights, which was a, a very nice guest house. Welcome to the Ritz, the Ritz Carlton. <laughs> We've got uh, our mosquito nets hanging over our beds to keep us from getting malaria, which Brings. is good for Rudy. <laughs> this, is, this is the shower. Uh, we've got to fill the toilet right now. The water's out in this town because the, apparently the water company didn't pay their electric bill, so they can't pump water to us. So we're taking showers out of a bucket. There's breakfast. We each had, uh, we each had one hard-boiled egg. Um, so we did, we did rough it just a little bit. The next thing we did was uh, we went to work with Heather and the orphans. It was really, really cool to spend time with them because they don't get a lot of attention from adults. Um, their parents are either very sick or gone uh, from AIDS, and the, uh, the community absorbs the orphans, uh, and the community is already very poor. So the orphans are seen as a burden more than something to be cared for and loved. So um, for men to come and spend time with these children, that's just the fact that you came. That's the biggest accomplishment right there. We were basically there to just to, to love on these kids, to hold them, to talk with them, to listen, to kick soccer balls around, just to play with them. I mean, basically just to allow Jesus to love them through us. I think the thing that impacted me the most about working with the orphans was realizing that a lot of the things we did with them was the first time they've ever done it. Part of our program is not only to educate the kids, but also to expand their um, worldview by taking them to do things that they would never be able to do otherwise. So one of the things that we do is we bring them to the Catali Club, and they get to eat a nice buffet, and they also get to go swimming, and we, um, we'll take them to a museum, and these kids have never been into a museum or anything like that. So they're, they're a little bit um, nervous at first, but then they get used to it, and they get used to the visitors, and they warm up, and then they have a very nice time. When the kids drove up to the club, their faces just lit up, because Heather was telling us that some of them have never eaten in a restaurant before. And the girls I was sitting next to, I asked them how old they were. Two of them were 10 and one was 11. So that gives us some idea of what life is like for them. That was a really humbling experience for all of us, I think, uh, to put a plate in front of some of these kids and see the expression on their face. Like, oh my goodness, is that for me? Uh, I mean, some of them have never even had meat before. And to, to put a plate down in front of them and look at the expression on their face, it, it, it really touched all of us deeply. We thank you for this beautiful place and for this wonderful food. We pray that you will use it to make us strong. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Kula. Kula. I guess because we cared, we were willing to hug them, we were willing to sing with them, we were willing to play with them, uh, take them to a swimming pool take them to a little zoo, uh, and let them tell us about the animals. Um, giving them a sense of worth in a, in a situation where they feel so unwanted was just a real ministry. After that, we went and did two days teaching with 19 pastors from Mount Elgon. And I guess my first impression of the pastors was I was outside a cool, crisp morning, uh, sitting in the shade of a kind of a fir tree thing and, and then hearing some singing coming from one of the buildings. When I heard that I thought well, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go check that out so I walked in there with my video camera and and saw them worshiping corporately but then 
After a few minutes, they all broke off individually into their various corners of the room and really began to just worship and, and pray and, and praise the Lord. And, and I, I saw through the lens of my camera, I saw them touch the throne of God. And, and I realized that they had something that I lacked. And uh, I had to shut the camera off and, and, and weep for about 10 minutes because it was, it was so powerful. What do you think about this morning, going over there? I think uh, I have a long way to go to get what they have. Yeah. Um, and I want to get there. The posters from Mount Elgon are all a part of, of uh, a training program called The Ark. It's a, it's a training program that they own, they design. It's facilitated by Brian Jameson. Uh, but he asked if we would come and preach on the family. Okay, today I want to talk about marriage. Some of us gave our testimony, some of us, you know, taught. A lot of the ideas that we shared with them were, were just mind-boggling for them. It really rocked their world. It was revolutionary thinking. Are you looking at only your side of the page? Or are you realizing that she has a page that looks different from yours? I try to make it number one on my list to serve her. Okay. The next one. Honesty. It was fun sharing with them the biblical view on what a godly marriage relationship looks like. Each new phase will be one of new skills. And I want you to think about what are your roles in a marriage? To hear them take everything we said absolutely literally and, and with the willingness to obey. Does the Bible say that? I want to do that. That really impressed all of us. I mean, so much of what we were teaching them was it was foreign to them. Uh, yeah, it was in the Word of God, but it was so countercultural to what they were used to. Um, but they would say, okay, that's what I have to do, that's what I have to do. And at one point, uh, they all broke out into a, a prayer session. And these guys, just like I had seen earlier, got down on their faces and were saying, Lord, please make me the husband that I need to be, make me the father that I need to be, help me to have the, guy, the, the kind of godly marriage that I, I need to have. And uh, I know it, it, it impacted all of us, and, and, uh, and we started praying the same thing. It was very humbling for all of us, but it was such a privilege for us to be able to teach these men the Word of God. And uh, they appreciated it so much. Jesus say, love one another. Jesus say, show them my love. Jesus say, love one another. Show my love, show my love, you are mine. Why don't you greet somebody and tell them you love them? I love you. Put your hands together and praise the Lord. Oh, that's great. I love that. That's beautiful. Thank you. I will miss you. We will miss you too. <laughs> Brian, bye. 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 See you <laughs> A question from last week, how would one explain the reason Yahweh needed sacrifice blood for remission of sin, and how would you explain that to a non-believer? Well, actually, that's pretty easy, because really every culture around the world, Christian or otherwise, has this understanding that it takes blood to atone for sin. Um, you know, the... Native Americans did it. Lots of cultures would have this understanding of sacrificing innocent blood to pay for sin. In fact, I was a missionary in uh, Kenya, and I was working with Maasai warriors. And this one guy, uh, his name was Moses, incidentally. That was the guy's name. He was our driver. Um, he told me, he, <laughs> it's kind of a funny conversation. You know, he and I had hit it off early in the week. And so, you know, he, he would take his places and we would talk and stuff. A lot of times I would sit next to him in the, in the driver's seat, you know, beside him uh, up front. And so one day we're driving and he turns to me, he says, I'm a hybrid. <laughs> and he knows nothing about my research, you know, <laughs> but he, so, you know, he tells me he's a hybrid. I'm thinking, what? <laughs> You know, because of all my Nephilim research and stuff like that. So I was kind of like, what are you talking about? You're a hybrid, you know. Uh, and, you know, he, he says, well, it, what he meant by that was that his mother and father were for, from warring tribes. And his father's tribe had raided his mother's tribe. And, uh, you know, it was the whole rape and pillage deal. And his, his mother was raped by this, uh, 
person from this other tribe and eventually he made or forced her to be his wife or whatever and he was the product of this so that's what he meant by he was a hybrid uh from two different warring tribes but he was describing in in the process of his story that what his mother's tribe did was they had sacrificed some goats and they had spread the blood all over the camp to atone for the evil that had been done by the other tribe. And so that was their way of kind of trying to reconcile the, the evil that had taken there and kind of get a reset. But they understood that the blood of innocent animals is what's needed because that for whatever reason, that's life is in the blood. And God says that, that there's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And, and that understanding has permeated every culture. So, you know, he told me the story, but it actually worked out interesting because we had the Jesus film translated into Swahili and loaded onto a, a, an iPod. And we had a miniature battery powered video projector. And so we hung a bed sheet on, on a mud hut and we had the Jesus film translated into their language showing on this little projector on the mud hut. And when it got to the part where Jesus was being nailed to the cross, the Maasai warriors start laughing. Well, that's not the response you're hoping for, you know, as missionaries, you're there and you're thinking, uh, why are they all laughing? You know, And so I got kind of discouraged by that because I was like, what do you do with this? I mean, these guys think this is a comedy, you know? And so I, Moses was over by the generator. So I went over to Moses and I said, can I ask you something? And he said, sure. And I said, have you seen this film before? Oh yeah, I've seen it six or seven times. I see it every time you missionaries come out here. He says, but I don't get it. I said, what do you mean? And he explained to me why everybody thinks it's funny because a Maasai warrior is a rite of passage into manhood. When, a, when, a, when they turn 13, they hand the boy a rope and they say, go kill a lion <laughs> with a rope and don't come back until you do, you know? So they either get killed in the process of trying to kill a lion or they prove their manhood by killing a lion with a rope rope and they you know bring the carcass back as proof of it was and, there a lot of men in that tribe uh, yeah but they had you know their share of scars and stuff you know um but i mean that's their rite of passage to prove manhood so the idea that the son of god could be nailed to a tree by a bunch of soldiers was comical to them they thought it was ridiculous they thought it was stupid you know they, they didn't understand what was going on there and when Moses explained this to me, that this was his point of view too. I mean, he'd seen it a number of times. He thought it was stupid. He's just toting the stupid Americans around. You know, it was his job. Um, I, but it occurred to me, the story he told me earlier in the week, I said, well, Moses, I might be able to shed a different light on this for you. And I said, do you remember the story you told me about your father's tribe and your mother's tribe and what happened after the, the camp was, you know, defiled what did you do and he said yeah we they sacrificed lambs and goats and stuff and spread the blood to to pay for the sin i said that's what that movie's depicting right there god shed his the blood of his lamb for the whole world not just for one tribe not just for one camp for the whole world i mean i said you understand there's evil in the world right he says yeah i mean it's evil everywhere i said well just like your camp understood that you had to shed the blood of that goat or that lamb to pay for the sin that was took place in your mother's village, God himself did that for the whole world. So that would be, you know, it's a long answer, but it illustrates the point, I think, is everybody understands that there, you, it takes blood to pay for sin, but God himself sacrificed the innocent, his own blood to pay for the sins of the world. So we don't have to do that anymore. You know, by one sacrifice, it has been taken care of, and, and he's not going to be killed again. So that's why we don't do the animal sacrifices anymore. There's a quick question to follow up on the Moses, uh, your conversation with Moses. Mm -hmm. uh, this comes from Ted. He wants to know how Moses accepted your explanation of. Yeah, the I'm, I'm glad you asked that. Uh, that night, he was. I saw a, a light bulb kind of go off. You know, that light bulb moment. You know something in his eyes, it clicked because he'd seen the movie six times, he said, but he didn't understand what the point of it. He didn't, he didn't get it. But when he connected the, the, the dots with his own personal life story experience and, and, and could all of a sudden like, Oh, I, I think I get the movie now. Um, 
I didn't know if I was going to see him again. And there wasn't much more to the conversation because we got, we had to get busy and we had to do other things that night. And the next day we were flying out of, uh, we, uh, out of there. We were like at the base of Mount Kilimanjaro and we were flying, I think, uh, we had to go to Nairobi or something. I forget where it was. But anyway, we, we, kept, we had to get on a, one of those puddle jumper planes the next morning. And so I was praying for Moses. I'm like, you know, Father, please, you know, work on him. You know, he, he's had enough spending time with us and with other missionaries and seeing the film that certainly enough seeds have been planted. I just pray that, that whatever I watered would reap a harvest. Well, I was literally just about to put my foot on the, the step to get on the plane, and I see Moses' truck speeding. I mean, he was like speeding to, to get to us before we left. He pulls in the parking lot, jumps, up, jumps out of the thing, runs. Oh, I'm, gonna, I'm getting choked up here. Um, he runs up to me. And he hugs me, wraps his arms around me. He goes, last night I prayed. I prayed, brother. I prayed to receive that sacrifice. So he did. He did. <laughs> He did accept, and he, he did everything he could to get there. It literally caught me just as I was stepping on the plane to tell me that. Yahweh moved in him. Oh, boy, that's just. Wow. Eh, okay. Hey, have you stayed in touch with uh, Moses nope, at all? Never saw him again. But I'll see him. I'll see him again someday. Maybe You'll in the exit. The Maybe when we get pulled up, because I, I believe the exit is going to take us to Africa. So who knows? We we may reunite. <laughs> in, in the triangle, guys. Yeah. You know, 